Uh, I'm very happy to be with you, Alex. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking today uh, at your uh, reissuing Animal Liberation, which many people see as one of the most, if not the most important work in the history, of, or the, at least the recent history of animal ethics. Uh, first published in 1979, and then I think reissued in 95. Uh, I've had a chance to read through the, the revised edition, Animal Liberation Now, and I noticed that uh, a few things had changed in the introductory chapter, uh, putting forward the ethical case for our moral consideration of animals. I noticed that some arguments had been adapted, some in, uh, redacted entirely, it seemed. I wondered, what is it that made you feel now was the time to update this volume? Well, in fact, it hadn't been updated since 1990. I think the um, 95 reissue was something that came out with a different, a new preface maybe, um, but the, the text itself was written before 1990. So if you looked at, for example, the experiments I describe in the chapter on experiments on animals, they would all be from 1990, uh, 1989 or earlier. And clearly, you know, 33 years after that, that's becoming a bit irrelevant if somebody wants to say, well, are we still doing bad things to animals in labs? Uh, and the same is true, uh, perhaps in some more subtle changes with factory farming, that um, things have moved on uh, in some cases, slightly for the better, in some cases, definitely for the worse. Um, and so it's no good, you know, talking to people about how animals were treated in factory farms in 1989 or earlier. That's not really relevant. Uh, so I wanted to bring that up to date. Plus, there has been quite a lot of uh, philosophical discussion about a range of issues. I wanted to um, say something about those discussions, um, new new topics, new fields that have been raised, like the suffering of wild animals, I wanted to comment on. Uh, and finally, a lot of people ask me, um, well, has there been progress since the original edition of Animal Liberation came out? What do you feel? You know, Do you think you've achieved something? And that's a bit of a complex story, but I did want to say something about what has happened and what has not happened uh, during that period. So what has changed since 1975 in terms of our treatment of animals and experimentation and animal farming uh, that's sort of morally significant for you? Well, um, let's take the, the, the use of animals in raised for food, so farmed animals, um, because that's by far the biggest area in terms of the numbers of animals we raise for food. It's, it's absolutely vast, um, including uh, fish factory farms, so-called aquaculture, uh, we're probably around 200 billion animals being produced each year, raised and killed each year. Um, and that dwarfs uh, the number of animals used in experiments, which is probably around 200 million. So you know, it's a thousand times more we're talking about in animals raised for food. Uh, and that's one of the biggest things that has happened, that that has expanded. And it's expanded to a considerable degree because a number of other countries where there was no factory farming and where there was relatively little consumption of animal products, uh, largely because of poverty, um, have now greatly expanded their animal production. And so, you know, China is the obvious example. Uh, there are tens of billions of animals in factory farms in China um, uh, who were not there uh, when I first wrote the book. And um, the conditions you know, are pretty terrible. Um, so that's that's the bad news. Um, the good news, I think, is that some progress has been made in uh, some countries, and I would say especially in the countries that make up the European Union, and I would include the United Kingdom, although it's no longer part of the European Union, but generally they have maintained the laws about raising animals that existed when they were in the European Union. Um, so... Uh, that they're positives. Some of the things that I described in the first edition, like the standard very small battery cages, the wire cages for hens, or the individual stalls for veal calves or for sows that prevented them really you know, walking more than a single step and stopped them turning around. The stalls are too narrow for them to turn around. They're no longer legal in the European Union. Um, but in the United States, for example, most of those things still are legal, generally, with the, with the exception of a few states uh, like California um, that have also followed 
the practices of the European Union to some extent and prohibited those practices. But most of the United States, and especially the states where most of the farmed animals are raised, um, don't have any, those laws protecting animals. I just pause um, there. Yeah. Oh, that, that's funny. Um, <clears throat> I was going to ask you, so um, just him bringing up the European Union and um, laws making it to have to have bigger areas for animals to turn around. Um, that just reminds me of when I talked to some people about um, what a lot of people will call welfare and not rights. And um, so I guess I was curious your thoughts on not only do I consider welfare to be rights, so anything that um, we would call fixing for farm uh, farm animals, um, any action we can refer to, if that was happening to us and we wanted that to not happen to us, that would be wanting the right for that to not happen to us. So I don't know if you view, um, if you view that as a right the same way I do. And then the other thing I was curious about is if, if we assume that the world isn't going to go vegan in probably our lifetime, um, then having part of our focus be on getting politicians to change laws to make like the U S have something kind of like, um, the, the, uh, wherever he was referring to, um, making it so animals are able to turn around. Do you think that's as important as I think that is? Yeah. So on the first question, uh, is welfare a right? I, yeah, I think welfare is a subset of rights. I think that it is one of several rights that we should concern ourselves with. Uh, and the way I would determine which rights are relevant is similar to what you said. You said, what would we, what rights would we want protected? I think it's what rights would we want protected if we were living in the animal's body, essentially with the animal's brain. So it's like, in that sense, I could see wanting my life, my right to life protected, but I probably wouldn't care so much about my right to privacy <laughs> or uh, my right to have my likeness used after my death or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, if I was an animal, I'd, yeah, go for it. You can use those things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think certain rights should should be considered and um, and it shouldn't necessarily be exactly the same for humans as it as it is for animals. But it, we should give consideration to what are the relevant rights for animals and then protect all of those rights of which welfare would be certainly an, a very important one. Mm -hmm. uh, any comment there? Or should I go to the second part? Um, no, I, I, well, I, I do. Yeah. Go to the second part. Okay. Um, and actually before I do, I just have a quick point of process. Uh, is anyone, mm -hmm. is anyone in the stream right now? And do they have any preference on whether we should be speeding up the playback for, uh, for the video? Like uh, it looks like there's actually. five people in here, and I, I'm I'm not sure. I'm not too familiar, but um, I I haven't done a playback like at a fast speed, so um, it would be an experiment for me. But I'm not trying <laughs> okay. it out. So okay, all right, cool. Well, if any if if it's too slow or something, just pop a note in the chat, and uh, we can we can try it at a bit faster. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the second your second question. Can you remind me what it was? Um. Advocating for policy for cages, big, bigger cages. Yeah, or yeah. Um, a lot of people seem to um, not care. Like, I guess that was the example I was going to bring up. So I'll ask this anyways. Um, I don't know if you saw the video I did where I talked to um, this lady, um, and I, I brought up instead of focusing on issues we currently have, I brought up a hypothetical of what if farmers um, could cut off the legs of cows, cauterize the legs put the cows on shelves to make room for them and fatten them up on a shelf. But the whole, its entire life, it's a, it's awake and aware and it, it's miserable because it's not walking around. Um, would this be something to focus on? And she said, uh, no, anything that we can do to animals, if we're going to kill them in the, at the end, then the animals wouldn't care if we fought for their rights to be comfortable or have legs. And we just need to focus on total liberation. Anything in between doesn't matter. And um, so, I, so I guess I was curious what your thoughts would be on that leg situation, but it goes right into this, which is if we can see a future of an unlikely world going vegan, wouldn't we want to put a bunch of our efforts into fighting for the well-being of the animals that are going to die anyways? Yeah, totally. Um, I, yeah, I completely disagree with that person's assessment of your, of your hypothetical there. Um, and I would just 
the way I would evaluate that is just put myself in that position. It's like if I was a if I was a cow and I and you face me with like, how would you like humans to advocate for for you right now? Um, given that in your lifetime, it's very unlikely that anything will um, will change with respect to your ability to like be a free cow or something, or you know your your children will be free. It's probably not going to happen. But something there's you know a 25% chance that we want that uh, that we can fix this thing where you're getting your legs cut off and put on the shelf or whatever. It's like yeah, I'd I'd, I'd go for that 25% chance. Focus on that. Like that's the so I think that the only the only way you could dispute that is by some bigger picture case of like the future suffering of. Um, you know, if we let's factor in the suffering that happens over the next 200 years with all farmed animals, if you could, if you could, if you had reason to believe that there was like a short term bad stuff to happen for cows right now, it's like, yeah, we got sorry cows right now, we got to chop off your legs and focus on the end goal here because we know we're going to get to it faster by this other means of activism that doesn't focus on your, um, your well being but it will get to that end state faster. So if you factor mm-hmm. in like the total suffering over the next 200 years, there you could make a case that um, that advocating for, even though it's not gonna happen in this cow's life, there'll be more total suffering or rights violations or, or less total rights violations. Yeah. So that that's the only way I could see arguing against that, but you'd have to, you'd have to, you'd have to, f- I don't know how you would know that necessarily with enough mm-hmm. certainty. You know, if we advocate for the the not chopping off legs, there's a certain improvement right now mm-hmm. for conscious beings, whereas we're sort of speculating on the best strategy for the future. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, did you have any thoughts on any of what was said uh, before I asked you that? Well, yeah. Um, so, so. Peter was talking about um, some of the changes in animal ag over the last, like, I don't know that the time period, but since uh, 1975 is when the book came out. Yeah. And he, he'd sort of chopped up a couple of different, like he said, since the, I think he said since 1995 for certain things. It, mm. Yeah. So um, I think they're, they're mostly focusing on, um, what's happening in Europe. I was just, I was wondering if, if there's anything specific in the U S that you wanted to comment on. I know like in Canada, for example, where I live, um, like gestation, there's this huge like gestation crate thing that, uh, the, the government was essentially going to be phasing them out ending. I think it was like around, it was either 2024 or 2025 was when they were mm-hmm. supposed to be complete. There was like a five year phase out period. And then, um, industry, sort of pushed back hard enough such that that was extended from the 2025 deadline to now a five-year phase out ending in 2029. Um, So that's just one example of how if there was enough pressure coming from the other side, I believe, like mm -hmm. from, you know, your case is always like we want to get meat eaters on our side for Mm -hmm. welfare is kind of pushes. And I just, I got to think, like if there was some huge petition signed or a lot of people that were made aware of this, that this was happening and there was a decision being made, if there was enough pressure to offset the industry pressure from the general public, not just coming from vegans, but coming from meat eaters as well, then maybe that, that law wouldn't have been um, delayed. And that's you know major, I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but we're talking like millions of pigs that you know have a substantial improvement to their life over that five-year period yeah yeah definitely <clears throat> and it reminds me of a video i watched yesterday a friend of mine that does uh, street outreach he had this conversation with this lady um on the street i think she her family had a farm anyways it was a pretty nice back and forth conversation but by the end the lady said something about i'm not going to stop eating me um but i gotta get going and um he very nicely because he's a calm guy said okay i just want you to remember that you are an animal abuser. Have a good day. And then, <laughs> and then, uh, and then she left. And I was just thinking, if 
people already hate vegans. If you have a conversation with a vegan on the street and they're the, the nicest like earthling ed type person and then you go home and you're talking to your friends, you're like, oh man, I used to think vegans were horrible, but uh, I talked to this one. He's really nice. Like you have that, that seed in your head. But if you go home and be like, oh, one of those stupid vegans told me I was an abuser. And I just imagine that, yeah, if, if there was this push of, hey, our, our country wants to put through this this rule that you can't like lock these pregnant pigs in this tiny cage um isn't that worth fighting for i i think that <laughs> would that would help um the cause more than calling somebody an abuser and so yeah just, just on that example i think like um the efficacy of a statement like that comes down to the rapport you've built with that person as well like if, if it was sort of a confrontational discussion and you were leaving maybe even on shaky ground before you said anything probably a probably not going to help your case by saying that but it you know if they if they felt like they learned something or they're like oh man yeah i didn't realize what you know that this was happening and all that and it's like I think that a statement like that can create more urgency in somebody's mind if, if you've established rapport to a sufficient oh, degree. Interesting. Yeah. So I, th I think it could go come down to case by case, but uh, it's an interest interesting point. The person, yeah, like think about what's going to happen next with that person and what's the, mm -hmm. what's the thing you can say that'll best influence, you know, the, the next step that they can take. Yeah. All right, here we go. Let's do it. So, of course, it's good news to, to hear of the improvement of conditions for animals on factory farms. Uh, but there are, uh, I, I think there are sort of two directions in which your, your views on, on animals could potentially be criticized. One is from the side that says that you know, animals don't have moral worth. We should be able to eat them and treat them as, as we please. But there's also a side that is uh, a more rights based uh, absolutist liberation approach that will say that celebrating things like larger cages and really what we're after is no cages at all uh, is potentially mistaken. I'm sure you've come across this criticism, but I wonder what you think of that, what you think the effect might be of saying, look, here are some great improvements in animal farming. Now, now you know, p pigs can't be kept in cages so small they can't be turned around, they can't turn around, but they can still be kept in cages. And by saying that, you know, we've made such great, tremendous strides, at least in the EU, in terms of animal welfare, do you think this might have an effect on uh, convincing people to empty the cages altogether because they're sort of lulled into a sense that actually animal, uh, our treatment of animals isn't that bad anymore? Can you actually pause before? Well, firstly, uh, let me say that, that, you know, you said tremendous. Yeah. I don't think he actually answers this super directly so i just want to res respond sort of to alex's point there which mm -hmm. is t tell me if you, if you agree with this is what he was saying but he said by creating welfare improvements and maybe this wasn't his main point but it's sort of an entailment of his of his point by creating these welfare improvements are we cre are we creating less urgency are we lulled into a sense of feeling that like, ah, oh, it's not so bad for the animals anymore. So maybe it, we don't need to take any further action and, you know, create a vegan world, for example. Um, I think that's, if not the main point he was making, it's certainly an entailment of what he said. And I find that just an absurd way to think about this. <laughs> it's like, yeah. like, if you just flip that to the opposite, it's like the reductio would be, creating worse conditions for animals right now to increase the motivation to get to that vegan world faster, which yeah. just seems you, so I odd. agree with you completely. And I know the majority of people that I talk with on my channel um, don't agree. So please don't be offended. But yes, it's absurd. It's completely absurd. And it's, it's based on one idea alone. And me not having knowledge of what's in the mind of every human, I could be wrong. But the only way that what he said makes sense would be if, he, if the majority of humans are so dumb that when they see something bad, instead of wanting um, something slightly better, they would jump to the end goal. And obviously they're not doing that because they're, they're the people that are not vegan. And <laughs> so, so I find it absurd and I think he knows it. I think, I think a lot of the questions he, Alex is asking here are questions for the people that attacked him. Uh, maybe not directly because they attacked him. I don't think he did this as a 
feel good about me type thing. But I feel like almost every question he asks is taking the the people that have bad ideas in veganism and he's asking Peter Singer those ideas. Um, because, because that's the thing. If you if a pig can't turn around and it looks so depressing that you could try to talk people into don't eat animals at all and you have this depressing thing to show them and that works, that works. But if the idea that if you make their lives less miserable, that somebody will go, oh, I don't, I don't want to stop eating meat because they're less miserable. If, if you don't have a good argument. That to convince somebody, then you don't, or they're not convincible. If if you make if you improve the well being of farm animals by fifty percent, and that makes people go, oh, that's good enough. If the other fifty percent, the the their lives and whatever else there is, if you, if you can't come up with an argument for why their lives shouldn't be taken then that just means you don't have an argument. It doesn't mean that you should make animals suffer to create an argument. Totally. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, and I can't remember how he responds, so I'm curious to see. Let's go. Tremendous improvements. I didn't say tremendous improvements. Uh, I said there have been some improvements. Ah. Um, so I, I'm not celebrating these as, you know, huge successes. I, I do think they're improvements. I think they give um, you know, many millions of animals, and including the laying hens. We're talking about hundreds of millions of animals, um, uh, somewhat better lives. But it's quite true that they are still can still be kept in cages. Um, they're not always kept in cages. One of the advantages of these improvements is that uh, it raises the cost of producing the animals or their eggs, whatever it might be, um, not very greatly, but to a small amount. And therefore, some farmers may say, well, you know, given that we can only keep them in larger cages, we might not keep them in cages at all. Um, uh, and the other thing about the cost being raised is that um, some people may therefore decide to buy fewer of those products um, or they may decide not to buy them at all and to buy to move to a plant-based diet. Um, and when we get plant-based foods competing with uh, animal products, then uh, price is going to be relevant. And at the moment, those plant-based foods are not really competing economically with the cheaper end of animal products. But uh, if we can improve welfare conditions, then they'll have a better chance of, of competing because the Pause price of second. those animal products will go up. So, Just a really quick point on this. Mm -hmm. I think I, I don't think he's wrong about that, but I think it's it's sort of irrelevant <laughs> to the larger point here. It's like the reason that welfare improvements are good isn't because it, you know, inc increase, what, what was it, increases the, the cost or increases the cost of animal products and therefore like adjusts the supply demand curve such that more people will eat, eat uh, plant-based food. Like that's, that's not the reason it's good. The reason welfare improvements are good is because it helps the animals that are experience experiencing that. And I think like mm -hmm. maybe that comes down to just a, a fundamental disagreement between Peter's underlying like moral framework and mine, like he, I think mm -hmm. he, he claims to be um, a utilitarian and a consequentialist, which the way he would evaluate all actions is based on the total utility or the total uh, consequences that are entailed from, from taking that action. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, anyway, he, we, we can talk about that more when he, when he brings it up, but mm -hmm. I, I just like, I just wanted to point out like, that's not the reason when when we're talking about at least i think you and i when we're talking about we want to see improved welfare for animals that are being factory farmed it, we don't want it because it's going to increase supply and demand and make people you know make it more expensive mm -hmm. and uh, like that's it's a nice benefit of it but it's like yeah. not the main reason well, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt and assume the best I can. And so I, I just assumed that he was he was feeling this is an added benefit and didn't word it well. But um, I think it's a I think it's an added benefit that like, yeah, if you make um, cages have to be bigger and then therefore the animals have more better welfare. But then also because the cages are bigger, the farmer has less animals, so they have to charge more for the meat Then that um, that helps as well. Um, sure. I mean, it's like if it was the case that it was the other way, though, would we still advocate for the welfare improvements? Like, I think we still would. 
It's like even if the welfare mm -hmm. improvements made it cheaper to produce and more likely for people to be able to afford animal products, like I would still want the welfare. Oh, oh, yes, definitely, definitely. Um, and one thing I thought of, because I think people have a hard time um, picturing it well, because it's funny because it goes hand in hand with people that eat animals. If they could see into slaughterhouses, they would stop. But vegans, if they could see into slaughterhouses, <laughs> they would stop being anti-welfare. <laughs> um, I, I, I really think that they just aren't picturing it well. So picture it with a human. Picture that you have that um, a government um, is able to and um, they take all the homeless people that can't have that can't get jobs and um, they they put them in some kind of a, a shelter and the shelter is really bad. It, uh, the, they don't have heating. They don't have AC. It's just like constantly um, like the shelter barely does anything, but it's better than being out on the street. And then you have like a, a very minimal amount of food stamps or something like that. If somebody wants those those people to at very least be in a certain final home with certain warmth or something and um, a certain amount of food, you, you don't say, okay, they're going to come in and remove uh, the, the lead paint from this house to make, to make the, I don't know how all that works, but to make these people not breathing in lead or whatever, you don't go, no, 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 no. If you do that, then people are going to think these people are well off and they're not going to fight for more rights. Let's let them breathe in more lead and then their grandchildren will have freedom. It's, <laughs> you just, <laughs> I just don't get yeah. it. Yeah. Well, it so, okay, can I take just a second here? Um, you can do whatever you sorry, want. Sorry, one sec here. Uh, it's giving me tips. I'm trying to share a screen. Okay, yeah. And, and then after you do that, there's a question in chat that I'm going to ask. Okay, cool. Entire screen. All right. So I think it's going to pop up on your thing. You'll have to push it to the main window. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, add to stream. There we go. So, okay, so this is essentially, we, we've talked about this a couple of times. I don't know if we've actually talked about this um, on stream, but this is the, uh, I, I want to name it like the the activism efficacy syllogism or argument or something like that. And it basically, it goes, um, there's three, right, three premises, P1, P2, and then a conclusion, P3. Um, and so I'm going to, I'm going to read it out and then I'll, I'll write it down in a simpler form. But so P1, first premise, if it, if it is the case that the efficacy of progressive activism, that just means like step-by-step, step, that's sort of how I'm defining that. Mm -hmm. Uh, if the efficacy of that is higher than, um, the efficacy of abolitionist activism, i.e. only focusing on the end goal. So if it's the case that progressive is higher than abolitionist, the then engaging in progressive activism is preferred over engaging in abolitionist activism. So mm -hmm. if progressive activism is greater than abolitionist activism, then it's, uh, let's just say it's like, it's better, um, it's better to focus on uh, PA. So PA is like better. Mm -hmm. So then premise two, it is the case that the efficacy of progressive activism is higher than uh, the efficacy of abolitionist activism. So it is the case that PA is greater than AA. Okay, so if PA is greater than AA, then PA. PA is greater than AA. And then the conclusion obviously is a, is a very simple um, argument, but then uh, therefore PA is the preferred activism choice. So mm -hmm. if you disagree with it, it, like this is logically valid so the, the question is its soundness is which you can call into question any of these premises but i think it, it's it, it's important to to ask the question are you disagreeing with premise one or premise two if you're disagreeing with premise two you're just saying well we yes it's true that if this if it was um if we were getting to that end state that the, the efficacy was like, if there was a better outcomes from focusing on PA, if it was true, yeah, we should do it. But hey, it's not true. This We disagree mm -hmm. with this one, for instance. And here's the reasons why we disagree with this one. Or maybe 
maybe you're not, maybe your argument is with, with this, even if like, even if PA was better than AA, we, 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 we want to go with the abolitionists. It doesn't matter because we're focused on, you know, ending exploitation and period mm -hmm. full stop. So I think it's important, like when we're, when people are disagreeing with this point that we kind of call into question, are they disagreeing with P, P1 or P2? So the stuff that Peter's mm -hmm. talking about right now in the video, um, this is, so he, he's on board with this, by the way, like, I, I think at least that um, he's, he, like, he's, his whole position is around progressive activism. And he's all talking about when he's saying that, um, you know, it increases demand, and it's better for the animals and stuff. He's all, all of these are like points in favor of this. So yeah, that, that was mm -hmm. my, that was my point. You can. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and in talking to people, um, they claim that they're in favor of P1, that, but that P2 is inaccurate. So even to the extreme with the lady I talked to about the cutting off of the cow legs, what, what her claim is, is that even if we allow cow legs to be cut off now and for the foreseeable future, that she thinks that it is likely that if we focus on letting cows have their legs, then that's going to push the total abolition so far into the future. Now, I don't think um, I've heard a good argument for that, but it, that seems to be the claim by everyone. One of the biggest claims I hear, and this is a very popular thing in the vegan community, uh, at least online or on YouTube, is that welfare ideas have been around for 200 years, and what we have now is worse than what we had then. And I think um, I don't think that's a fair argument because what we have now being as bad as it is is due to figuring out um, the the commercial benefit of uh, using factory farms to their extreme, using using as much room as possible. That is just due to innovation. And it's not due to welfare's approaches 200 years ago not working. Um, but so how how good of an argument do you think um, somebody needs to have to focus on uh, AA versus PA? I don't, I, I don't think they necessarily need to have a good argument. I think they, they just need to be convinced of it, like for, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully for good reasons. But if you have, if, because efficacy is another kind of word that has to be defined and I, I think people could have a different definition of it is it like is it the total suffering over the next 200 years is that what we mean by efficacy mm -hmm. um you know which one will reduce it more or uh which one will reduce the most rights violations or is it like or how else like maybe it's just which one gets to that end state faster maybe that's how you define efficacy is how do we get mm -hmm. to that end state i still think there's a case that maybe the progressive activism could get us there faster even if that is the the bar for efficacy but yeah so you gotta you gotta like define what you what you what criteria you're using for efficacy which i think yeah you can do individually like i, th I think you can apply the syllogism regardless of your definition and see if if the premises hold up but yeah, I think that if somebody has a reason to believe that one is better than the other, it would be a good it would be a good test like for that person if you just built it into the hypothetical. Like, hey, like how how do you define efficacy in this in this case? Well, like it's getting to the end goal the fastest. Okay, cool. So ab full abolition is is what we mean by efficacy. So um what if it was the case that progressive activism would actually get us there faster and focusing on, you know, the cow leg um advocacy or activism would actually um would actually get us to that end state faster then then how would you focus your activism i would be curious to hear what that person would think but mm -hmm. you got to think for them to be logically consistent they would need to say progressive activism yeah um speaking of that so this first question uh, that i think we both should answer is if you had to pick a single practice in the animal agriculture industry to be abolished, what would it be? Cool. Um, I don't know how detailed of single practice it would have to be, um, but I think in general, um, the most reasonable thing to outlaw would be just the dairy industry completely. I, I think um, the even if we continue to um, eat animals, the 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 forced pregnancy, the removing the cow from the mother, and then um, 
the the taking the milk instead of the, the calf having it. Um, that that's probably what I would do if I could snap my fingers and change one thing. Yeah, there's like two ways to think about this. One is like the uh, factoring in the number of animals that are having the the bad thing against them, and the other one is just the the severity on a per animal basis. Mm -hmm. uh, on the per animal basis one, like oh my gosh. Uh, I would off the top of my head probably say something like the what they do to to pigs to prevent um, cannibalization and like things like that, like the cutting off the tail, ripping off the genitals, like the mm -hmm. cutting, like clipping the teeth. Sure. That was my, that was my next one. If 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 choosing the entire dairy industry was not acceptable, it would be the pig one, and you would have to include the amount of pigs that could be in um, one area. Because the the reason the the argument for cutting the teeth and the tails is for the animals' benefit, and so I think since that I would don't have think to that's go, the case. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I that's think... what. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's probably because of the cannibalizing of the tails. Uh, leads to infections and right. then the the pigs die off. So yeah, they care about the product. Um, but some people would argue that it's for their own good. Um, but uh, but yeah, yeah. I I think I think that would be the first thing that has to go because I mean, cutting off the beaks is bad of of uh, chickens, but uh, not compared to cutting off teeth and tails. Um, so yeah, my my. Aside from the dairy industry, my first would be probably the the pig teeth and tails. My second might be, and I need to learn a little more about this, would be um, filling chickens with so many hormones to grow them faster to the point where their legs break out from under them and they're just sitting there and can't move. I think um, I think there would have to be some kind of a practice that that makes it to where you can, if you can pump them full of hormones, it has to be a certain amount that wouldn't be likely to lead to leg breaking. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I, that may just made me think of foie gras and that, that mm. might actually be even worse than the, the pig thing. For yeah. Me. Do you know if that's legal in um, the U S or in Canada or is that just a, like a European Asian thing? Yeah. We should look into that. Um, okay. Here we go. Uh, so that's the first part of my answer, that I, I do think that this helps economically to replace these animal products. The second part of my answer is that I think it actually disregards the interests of animals to say we should not work for improvements in their welfare because what we want is the abolition of animal exploitation full stop. Now, of course, I want the abolition of animal exploitation full stop too, uh, I would I would love to see that happen, but I don't see a way of making that happen uh, within the foreseeable future. Um, you know, I'm certainly argue, prepared to argue, and I do argue in the book for um, eating a, a plant-based diet. I think that's definitely the most ethical diet. But uh, and and I'm pleased. I talk about the fact that there's been a rise in in vegan or plant-based eating over the last couple of decades. Very good. But, you know, how many vegans do we have, say, in the United Kingdom? The figure that I've seen is, is 1.2 million. So um, that's... Okay, this might not be good to do at this point since we both have seen this and we're kind of, we talk about things in advance. I, I don't want to forget what he just said there um, because when I, when I hear people critique him, I think they miss that. And I think it's important. He said he wants animal liberation full stop. Do you think he means that? And anytime he talks about things that he deems as acceptable, he's saying out of all the bad practices, this, these couple are the better ones. Or do you think he doesn't mean full animal liberation? He just means something close to it. Um, yeah, his, uh, his position will be fleshed out through the video i think a little bit more and I, I think he wants it in the sense that oh yeah if i could you know push a button and get it i would push the button mm -hmm. but he also says um he says certain things that lead me to believe that he's maybe less he wants it less badly than i do or something i don't know mm -hmm. um because like later on in the in the video he he talks about how like the occasional indulgence on eggs and things like that is is acceptable 
and mm -hmm. that just it seems not consistent with the position that that he yeah. really wants animal liberation full stop yeah yeah it just it just makes me wonder if um because something being acceptable if we removed all the things that people view as acceptable um for example i don't think people should own pets but uh within a conversation um, I would likely say something that seems like I'm in favor of you owning your dog. Um, if I had to guess out of all the humans I know who's probably best with their pets, um, you're probably one of them. And uh, I, I wouldn't forcefully remove your dog from your hands, um, even though, full stop, I don't think humans should have cats or dogs. So um, I give him the benefit of the doubt of I think that no matter what he says in this video, that he wants that um, and that the rest is just... Um, is just um, philosophizing of what what isn't that bad compared to other things. Yeah, I want to. Can we actually maybe put a pin on that because l later in this, um, he brings up his main point. I think against against that is the uh, you can do no harm as long or what is it? Um, you can do no harm as long as you're not leaving someone worse off than they would have otherwise been the mm, good point because so, i don't so agree that, with, yeah 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 so let's let's pick that back up when he when he brings that up for sure it's terrific you know it's a huge improvement over when the book was first appeared when probably it was in the hundreds or definitely in the thousands not tens of thousands um so that's great but um, it's still a small percentage of the population and it still means that most Britons are eating animal products and they are eating factory farmed animal products. And um, I don't see that just calling for the abolition of animal exploitation is going to lead to that glorious day when uh, there are no animal products produced or consumed um, you know, within the next 20 or 30 years. So you're going to have generation after generation of these animals living in horrible conditions uh, and the, those people who say we shouldn't work for improvements are essentially condemning them to those horrible conditions for many years to come without any real basis i think with or any real evidence for saying that we will um, improve the prospects of abolishing animal exploitation if we set ourselves against working for uh, any kinds of improvements um, I don't see that that's going to work at all. And in fact, if you look at the countries that have the largest numbers of, of vegans, they're also countries that have better animal welfare policies. Again, like the United Kingdom, like some of the countries of the European Union, um, they uh, have significantly higher proportions of people who are not buying animal products at all than many of the other countries that have terrible conditions and no animal welfare laws. I think for many people it might be something of a point of principle that uh, advocating for improvements in the conditions of animal welfare seems to be a, an implicit uh, an implicit condoning of the fact that they're being exploited at all. Now, I would imagine you wouldn't see it that way, but for example, you can imagine a time in which human beings were being uh, sold as, as property and uh, exploited and kept in horrible conditions and being an advocate for better conditions on the slave ships. It's a, an example that we commonly hear. Do you think that the Peter Singer of the sort of 18th century might have been as, uh, as open to that kind of approach to solving the problem of slavery. If you say, well, we're not going to get rid of this problem for, you know, an another sort of hundred years or so. And in the meantime, we may as well advocate for, for better conditions. Don't you think there's sort of something a bit undignified about advocating for better conditions of exploited people when the only conditions we should be uh, in favor of them experiencing is no exploitation at all? This is the biggest, biggest I think it really the depends video. on the prospects of... What's that? This is the for me the biggest cringe of the entire video is is his response here. Oh, gotcha. Um, I can't remember it, so I'll hit play and then afterwards I'll I'll make my comments on the the slave thing. Getting to no exploitation at all um, within a foreseeable time frame, um, and I think that slavery was human slavery was very different from animal exploitation or you know animal slavery, which is also what it is. Um, because it, it was something of a, you know, 
of a new thing in it when if we're talking about the slave trade that is the, the trade in African slaves crossed to the United States and uh, the Carib Caribbean and some British possessions before this British abolished the slave trade. Um, now we're talking about something which you know hadn't been going for very long, which was a sort of in innovation, uh, which was not allowed in the United Kingdom, for example. I mean, slavery itself was 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 said to be illegal, and um, so it and it was not true in the northern United States either. So it was it was not a universal practice by any means, um, although certainly you know, slavery has existed in various cultures, uh, unfortunately, for various times. But it was by no means a universally accepted practice or even a practice accepted by a large majority of people in, you know, the, generally the same culture, people who spoke the same language and exchanged ideas with each other. Uh, unfortunately, the exploitation of animals is still largely accepted by the great majority of people um, pretty much everywhere in the world. I guess, you know, there are some cultures, maybe um, uh, Hindus uh, who don't accept it or Jains, um, but uh, it is very largely accepted. And, and uh, that's why I think it's much harder to get rid of actually than uh, human, the human slave trade was. So that's, that's one difference. Um, was that the part, or is there the next part? Uh, you can let let him finish, and we okay. can. Yeah. But I would see, if people say, nevertheless, on principle, we must not say that it's justified to exploit animals if they have better conditions. Then we do have a, a deeper philosophical disagreement because I am uh, a consequentialist. That is, I judge what's right or wrong by its consequences, um, and. Uh, particularly, uh, more specifically, I'm a, I'm a utilitarian, which means I'm concerned about the well-being of uh, sentient beings, about um, reducing their suffering and increasing their happiness. And uh, so I'm not going to take a stand on principle unless I believe that taking a stand on principle or something that looks like principle is actually going to have better consequences for all of those affected by it. Uh, and as I've already explained, I don't believe that saying we're not going to work for improved animal welfare in factory farms is going to have better consequences. On the contrary, I think it's going to have clearly worse consequences. Um, All right. I, I like everything he said, so I'm curious to okay. see what, what you didn't like. Okay. Um, there's Okay. There's a lot to talk about here. Um, how do I want to do this first? So, okay, maybe I'll just start with, with asking you, if, since you agree with his, um, with his uh, point of view, it seems just so weird to me that he's saying, he, he, at first he said sla like the, the, the symmetry breaker between slavery and animal ag is that one is more universally accepted than the other. Mm -hmm. and, and then he goes on to give some examples of where slavery was accepted, like in the northern United States and in some parts of the world it was illegal. But then in other parts of the world, he says, uh, yeah, it was normalized culturally. So mm -hmm. is he, would his position on slavery have been completely the same as his position on animal ag? I was I was surprised that he didn't say what it was. I mean, mine is, and I'll explain that in a second. But um, I think what he's pointing out is that the Atlantic slave trade was this unique thing where before then, everybody's slaves was it was their own people. Every country, every every piece of land that had slaves, it was um, that culture's own people they had as slaves. So having um, the the with innovation, having these these boats that could go, they could go take people that certain people viewed as less than, and then sell them in an area. It was uh, this was like a new a new thing that had happened. So the idea of tackling something new that um, people view in disgust, and I think you might have said it backwards. Uh, the North did was against it, and and the South had it. So so uh, UK was against it. And um, the northern states in the U.S. were against it. Um, I'm not sure about Canada. I think Canada was probably against it as well. So it was this idea of 
this this uh, I think it was only three states in the South um, that had slavery, and um, and it, as as more states became states. Um, those southern ones got it as well. But I, th- I think the idea was that this horrible thing so many people were against and that fighting it from the beginning where it's been acceptable to kill and eat animals for all of time and that has never really wavered. And um, so I think that's a decent point. But um, that would be harder to fight. So uh, for sure, like harder to fight. Yeah. Um uh i like alex's question was would the peter singer of uh the 18th century or whatever he said um would that version of you have advocated for slave welfare if oh yeah he failed to answer that question for sure well he his answer was like he said a couple of things he said human exploitation is different and then he listed the some some of the differences specifically pertaining to slavery versus animal ag and the main difference that he gave was that in some parts of the world um slavery was less prominent than Mm -hmm. um and and whereas animal ag is universally accepted and so like if you created like a you know the hypothetical slavery 2.0 where it was fully universally accepted would his attitude change that it just seems like a weird thing to like to cause you to view something as moral or not based on like how many other people agree with it oh like i think he was just referring to how easy it would be to fight um as far as moral or not i i like to assume that he would agree with me and so i'll i'll just give my stance that if um I don't know how it is in Canada, but like here, if um, some children are living in in foster care or even not foster care, um, but there's concerns with um, their well-being at a house, then um, somebody will come from a department and come and see the house and check the conditions and see, um, see if there's like maggots coming out of a dead rat in the corner of a house just seeing if the kids should live there and that kind of thing and um and there would be standards there there'd be regulations saying um this is not a fit house for a kid so if slavery um continued in a way um where it was just abundant there's uh, uh, people could have slaves and we had the option of having somebody go and say Oh, you're not up to code. Like we need these welfare regulations to to make it so um, you need you if you have these uh, maggots in this room where you're having these slaves live, uh, you got a penalty. You have to pay a fine or go to jail or you lose your slave. Your slave goes to be sold to a better slave owner or something like that. Um, I would consider these regulations great. We should do anything to improve the welfare of humans, animals, whatever, anything that. Um, that deserves uh, moral consideration. We should um, legally improve their conditions until we legally um, outlaw the practice of something like slavery. Okay, that and seems I, I like that's different from his view. I just don't think he stated it, but I could be wrong. I, I think he just um, pointed out the, why it was easier to fight, but yeah, I could be wrong. Yeah, it, it, to, to me, the implication of that was that... Um, I I would have advocated for I or I, sorry I wouldn't I would not have advocated for the welfare of slaves as like the maggot moving the mag, slave in the maggot place to the non maggot place uh, because it would have it was easier and it's like mm. that that's how I took his position and it, like again this comes down to sort of the underlying moral philosophy of utilitarianism so maybe maybe his maybe like the the whole the larger point is just like, I, I will just do whatever maximizes utility. And it's like, if, you know, if, if there are factors, like it's more difficult to, to create change in a system to, you know, to focus on the abolition side of things that would, you, there'd be less, less utility created from that sort of activism. So I won't, I wouldn't activate or uh, activate. Uh, um, what's the verb of activism? <laughs> I wouldn't be active. Uh, advocate? Advocate. Yeah, I wouldn't advocate for, for that. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I, maybe I don't disagree as much as I originally thought. It, se- it, it just seemed like a weird symmetry breaker to me that just focusing on like the... Yeah, it- 
it, I think it really comes down to it, if he um, answered it or not. Like if, if that was his answer or if he only answered half of it. Um, so, yeah. Um, also, do you think there's a way to convince the world to understand what the word compare means? One of my least favorite things, no offense, uh, Garuda in the chat, but one of my least favorite things when it comes to discussing anything, politics, philosophy, whatever, is if you compare things, somebody thinks it has to be a one-to-one -one. and they don't, they don't realize that when you're comparing a situation, you're just pointing out that there is a similarity. You can take the worst thing that has ever happened and something that doesn't matter at all and point out the comparison. And so having people in chat say um, that you shouldn't compare animal stuff to slavery or Holocaust or whatever. Um, is, like, sure, I, I'm not a huge fan of the people that say um, this is this the animal Holocaust is worse than the Jewish Holocaust or whatever. Um, I, don't, I don't care about worse or not. It's can can we see similarity is enough to have a conversation about it. And I don't know how to convince people what the word compare means. Yeah. And this is, this is sort of what, like the word symmetry breaker is a good one for anyone who doesn't know of it to add to your sort of mental vocabulary as you're, as you're thinking about this. It's like any analogy will eventually break down, but we give analogies to illustrate uh, a point, a, a specific point about something. So the, the point about saying the, um, just like saying the animal Holocaust or something, the, the point is to show it's bad. It's, it, it affects a lot of um, sentient beings in a negative way. It's on a, on a massive scale. That's like, that's the point of it. It's, it's not to say that like it happened in Germany or whatever, or, you know, wherever, right? It's not to say like where it happened. That's an irrelevant difference so the point of like any sort of um when you're when you're discussing something it's you you're usually the point isn't to say are these two things exactly the same the thing the point is to say are they similar in a certain way and then there will be relevant differences potentially that that would be called symmetry breakers so you, you might say like no, no no it wasn't a holocaust because it didn't happen to humans and and that's relevant because a holocaust the definition is that it only applies to humans or something that could be like a, a relevant difference between the two that would apply to the the use of the word holocaust for example the fact that it happened in germany like or whatever it's probably not a relevant one so when you're looking at comparing things you're talking about um you, the the point of your discussion is relevant such that like you need to look for the the relevant differences between between the two things right yeah um I'm going to read uh, this person's comment real quick, respond to it real quick, and then just get right back into the video. But um, the person I was uh, talking to um, said, there is no similar uh, similarity between a slave owner and owning livestock. I am against slavery and support owning livestock um, and plants for food. It's dehumanizing. Okay, so here's the issue. Saying that there's no similarity between slave owner and owning livestock. The similarity is owning. There's a similarity between owning a slave and me owning this cup. That's, the similarity is owning. Now, the, the where there's not a similarity is the slave probably has a head. And I unless we label something as a head on this cup, this cup does not have a head. So the similarities are the similarities. And then where there's no similarities, there's none. So between the slave and the cup, one's alive, one's not. Between the slave and the livestock, okay, so they're both alive. Um, if you took something like um, if somebody had an oyster farm where it's not sentient, then there would not be the similarity of the sentience between the slave and the oyster. But if they had a pig, there would be the similarity. Again, it doesn't mean the pig is as important as a human, um, it doesn't mean that if you're against slavery, you have to be against eating animals. You could have various reasons for why you're in favor of it, but it doesn't mean there's not similarities. It does not mean that there aren't elements to compare. So, okay, here we go. Um, and that's why I wouldn't want to take a stand just on principle, irrespective of the consequences. Can I actually I hear you can described I as the father of the... Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna tr I'm gonna try to do this on the fly because I haven't. Is I haven't it gonna be on the same? Before. It's gonna be on the thing. Just bring it back up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, 
let's take the two things we're comparing x and y and there's like and then we just list out like all of the properties that are true of x and all the properties that are true of y so this you know this could be things if you, in your example um of the oyster farm versus the pig farm or, or yeah well i'll just use that for the example it's like uh, animal right animal sentient uh not sentient like um you know mass scale whatever mass scale like whatever all the things are for each one so in some cases like there will be similarities so like this is the same as this uh this is not the same as this this is the same as this and then there will so what's another another difference is like i'll, I'll do one more difference is like the you know these ones are live in water let's say or sorry this live on land yes maybe small and big or and then yeah live in water small big so these are different also but then there's a second layer of which ones are relevant so i'll use maybe pink for this so animal I, I don't think that that's relevant to the to the case of like the point you're trying to make is like is farming this good or not good so the sentience to me is a very relevant feature and it's a it's a symmetry breaker between the two so whereas like the the live on land live in water it's like it's it's different but it's not a symmetry breaker because it's it's a it's an irrelevant difference between the two so we're looking for things that are both a, um, a difference and relevant a relevant feature so like the yeah um so i can't remember actually why i started doing this but that was like sort of a, a way of um it, it, by what you're doing in a comparison is you list out all of the properties that are true of something and you can you can say which ones are the same which ones are different and then which ones are relevant to the to the the reason that we're comparing these to say whether it's a it's a good comparison or not and if you can come up with a, a relevant difference like in this case the sentience that could be the symmetry breaker that says that it you know an action is okay in in one case uh you know it's okay in this case but not okay in this case yeah no, those are, those are good points. And um, I'll read the comment that just came in by Garuda to see if Garuda uh, got anything from either of us. Uh, making a human work for free is the same as raising a chicken for food. Vegan logic, not comparable. Okay, so I don't think we got through. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I have, I mean, that's the thing. We're all different. We all have different ideas. And uh Garuda, I actually, even though a lot of people will call you a troll in here, I I don't I haven't seen that to I, I don't think that's what you're doing here or in other cases. Um and you've said things that I agree with. And so yeah, keep listening and we can all learn from each other. All right, here we go. Modern animal rights movement. Do you think that's something of a misnomer? If being a utilitarian, you're sort of looking at consequences and welfare of animals rather than something like a deontological right. I think it's something of a misnomer if I'm speaking to uh, philosophers or people who are well educated in philosophy. Um, and I know that uh, your podcast does deal with philosophical questions quite a lot. And I expect that your listeners, therefore, particularly the regular ones, um, you know, whether they've taken courses in philosophy or not, they've got through listening to your podcast uh, some familiarity with these issues. So for them, I think, to describe me as the father of the animal rights movement, um, they would say, hmm, how can a utilitarian be uh, an animal rights advocate? But for the general public who simply des describe the modern movement to uh, improve the status of animals in a quite radical way and going as far as saying we shouldn't be eating them we shouldn't be uh, you know, doing many of the things that we, that we do to them. Um, you know, many people just use the term the animal rights movement for that. And they don't specifically mean that this is a movement that is founded on the view that there are such things as intrinsic rights, either for humans or, or animals. Uh, they just mean, oh, well, these, these are the people who are asking for a radical change in the moral status of animals. Um, and I go along with that, of course, that is what I'm asking for. So in that 
popular sense, I don't mind being described as the father. Of- well, we've used the word Sorry, exploitation a number of times now, and. Sorry, uh, maybe maybe not super quick actually. And can you bring up the screen again? Uh, I'm just gonna. Oh yeah. Just very, as briefly as I can, um, just illustrate. So, when we're While thinking about like. This- well, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to apologize really quick because um, I the way I I, uh, I don't know, I, I think I came across very negative to the Garuda person. And even though it, it blows my mind, this idea of the comparing thing, I just I'm that's not the person I want to be. I don't want to be a person that says, OK, I'm going to read your thing. You clearly didn't learn from us. You're dumb. Um, we all take things in at different different times, different ways. Uh, maybe me and Michael are wrong. Um, and maybe maybe you're wrong and maybe you just don't know it now. Maybe you'll know it in the future. Maybe we'll know it in the future. So anyways, I just, I apologize for sounding negative. Go on, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So, okay. I'm, this is basically, I'm just going to illustrate um, Peter's moral system. And I think Alex, I think Alex is a utilitarian too. Is that right? Do you know? I think he's something like that. Yeah. Okay, so if we plot just moral value on the y-axis here, and then we plot um, well-being, which you know suffering would be in the negative, and pleasure or whatever would be in the in the positive direction, and like let's just take this axis. So utilitarianism is a very straightforward position where this is utilitarianism or or uh, consequentialism. So that's essentially like what he's doing when he's evaluating an action he's like if if there is no well-being there's like no moral value to the action if there is if you take a point higher on the line where there is well-being uh positive well-being or sorry if there is well-being um or pleasure there is a a certain amount of moral value that you would assign to that action Mm -hmm. right so it's it's good to do an action that's that's up here on the graph it's bad to do an action that's down here on the graph so that's utilitarianism where how that fits in there's Mm -hmm. a a competing moral system so deontology is essentially picking a picking an action so you'd pick like some point um and it it's basically just a flat line so deontology, it could be anywhere depending on the action. It could be like uh, a negative right that you're protecting from somebody or a, a, like a, a duty that, that you must do, depending on how what you what rights and duties you include in your moral system. But deontology is rule based morality, deontology. So it's basically saying like it's wrong to kill. So we, we just take killing it doesn't matter like the amount of of well-being it's it, there's like a flat line for each moral action right and mm-hmm. so the, you'd see the difference in how this would apply it, it doesn't matter how much utility is is created from um right like if if killing was created a ton of utility it would still be like a negative action. For example, if it created disutility, it wouldn't matter. It's it's still morally valued the same under deontology. So mm-hmm. that's the difference between those two. Um, where I sit on this, and I'd really love to hear your opinion on this after mm-hmm. Carson, is uh, a third line, which is it's called threshold threshold deontology, and it's essentially what you're doing is it's deontology, but um, up to a certain threshold of utility so it's like i still think you know i think killing is wrong but if a certain amount of utility is achieved by killing i'd be okay with it so it's like killing um i'm gonna say is wrong so i'm drawing you know at at zero well-being created i'm gonna say no to killing but like let's say that it's it's gonna save like a million lives or something I, I, mm-hmm. I might be convinced to kill somebody. And so let's like, let's say that point is somewhere like would this. pleasure Would pleasure ever factor in? Uh, to my moral system specifically? Um, it, it can uh, for, or cannot. Yeah, okay. it, it, it can be either. Like you could, you could have, um, you could have pleasure factor in or, or only, only suffering factor in or only, only rights, only okay. um, negative rights. I'm generally on the, um, on the negative rights side of the threshold deontology kind of thing. It's like mm-hmm. those, those value yeah. those factor in the most to me. Um, 
but just okay. Well, I have a response, the, but I don't know if you had finished what you were saying. Yeah, I'll just I'll just finish the line essentially. So it's it basically it plots like this, where it would be a similar line to the um, to the utilitarianism line, but shifted down to the degree that you value rights or protecting negative rights or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, before I say what I was going to say, um, Akash here says, um, the graph ignores the well-being that deontology provides. What are your thoughts on that? The graph ignores the well-being. Yeah, he's right. Um, yeah, yeah. Deontology okay. isn't focused on well-being. It's an irrelevant. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. I, th I think his, po his point might be that um that me and you are discussing that we care about the well-being as far as like um of animal conditions and farms but that we might be um consider ourselves to follow deontology and i think that the problem there is that our our moral framework would be the deontology of no killing animals but since they're being killed then we care about the well-being maybe that's what he's getting at um maybe but um uh, but so, so here's what i want to say about the th the threshold part um with i i agree with the negative rights but not with the pleasure i don't i don't care about pleasure in any way aside from my own um but okay so the, a problem i've seen with um with utilitarianism is if five men were to sexually assault i'm not going to use the r word um a woman and those five got so much pleasure that it outweighed the pain of the woman that due to utilitarianism in a strict form, that that would have to favor that action, right? And so then the, the issue I see with threshold deontology would be that that's not acceptable, but with the threshold, if you accept pleasure, then 10 million men sexually assaulting one woman right. um that much pleasure outweighs it <laughs> and uh I, you'd have to factor in how much uh negativity there is by 10 million with this one lady but let's say um they give her plenty of time in between or something and <laughs> um and it's a lady that can live forever but anyway so um so what people will call me a utilitarian and I, even though I'm very fascinated by um, philosophy, I don't usually get into the label, so I've never really countered it until now. But the the idea of pleasure and pain and which one outweighs means nothing to me. When um, when I care about something, whether it's humans or animals or whatever, I care about the suffering not happening, but I don't care if anybody... I think it's nice if somebody helps somebody out, but I don't like in any legal form or even a moral form, I don't care if anybody gives anybody pleasure or how that pleasure outweighs it. It's if you are causing unneeded suffering... I think that is wrong. Um, so, so how would you classify me off whatever I just said and ask whatever questions you need to? Um, but how would you classify me um, yeah. to humans and to animals? Um, so, yeah. So you're you are um, you value negative the the minimization or removal or whatever of negative rights. So. If, um, rights from something so from pain from death from whatever not rights mm -hmm. to something like to have pleasure to experience you know fun things and and that sort of thing you agree so far correct yeah yeah i'm i'm like um i'm mostly in agreement there um i would put some value on pleasure but almost in a different category it's like such that it it would um, I, I value it, but it would it almost no amount would ever allow for a negative rights violation. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, so I, mm -hmm. I would choose pleasure over not pleasure for anyone, but I wouldn't choose it if it entailed any sort of negative rights violation. That's where I'm, I'm currently sure. at, at least with with mine. But yes, um, so a question to clarify your moral system. Um, what so do you do you see yourself as more of a utilitarian or more of a um a like a threshold deontologist where do you, like is there um could killing ever be justified like okay would ki killing t two to save one yeah or like sorry, is there, kill, is there an outcome yeah. is there an outcome from a bad action that would make the bad action worth it well, let's um, even just say like kill killing two killing one to save two 
Uh, yeah, no, I don't. I don't think. And I think even when we discussed it, there were a few ideas that you made me think that if we get into the trillions and there's some added details, I could get there. But uh, no, I, I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't kill one to save a billion. One to save a billion, even. Okay, so you'd be yeah. very. So like, basically, if we if we look at this, um, your your bar would just be much much lower, like mm -hmm. much much lower, right? Um, but it's. It seems like it's not pure deontology because there is some threshold. It would just be how big is the threshold. Mm -hmm. So you're a, a threshold deontologist with a, a large skew to deontology and um, a preference for uh, reducing negative rights violations. Yeah, and that's what I would think too. A couple of people called me a negative utilitarian in the comments, um, or at least deontologist for humans, negative utilitarian for animals. Um, but I, I, I think it might seem like that, but I, I really don't think so. Um, but it would depend. I, I think I would. I think I maybe state things differently based on the legality that currently exists for harming animals. Therefore, um, I would rather less animals be harmed and I'm not looking at the individuals, but if it was illegal to kill animals, I don't think I would personally choose to have the trolley car, um, hit the one to save the five. I, I don't think I would create, I don't think it would be right for me to sacrifice any to save any. It would just be, I can claim that an action is wrong because it's removing the negative rights. Um, so, so I do think I'm almost strictly a deontologist in, in this sense, if I'm fully understanding it, um, uh, there's no, there, it wouldn't matter if there was 50 billion worlds and they were all full of humans. And, um, the only time I would decide to not like the only way I would sacrifice one to save every other human would be, um, in that case, because if I'm saving one whether it's myself or not myself, I'm not even in the picture, then I know that humans are social creatures and that's going to drive that person insane. But if I could, if there were, everybody was going to die except two and I could kill the two to save every other human on all the planets, I wouldn't do it. I don't think. That's crazy to me. It's insane. Um, <laughs> cause, cause, cause I, 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 it, the rights make sense. The negative rights make perfect sense in my head, but but uh, somebody's existence, aside from me wishing they could keep that existence if they want it, um, I, I I just can't. I I don't imagine. I was talking to my brother about it the other day, and I like I I don't if if uh, humans stopped being able to have babies and weren't going to um, the humans weren't going to keep going, it doesn't change anything for me. I don't I don't I don't think I would feel any kind of weird sadness other than knowing that humans have a desire to make more humans to have children and grandchildren. And so I don't know if there's just something off with me, but, um, but yeah, I think I'm just a pretty strict deontologist, I guess. Do you, so does the same thing apply to pain in your system or is it just, um, just death? Yeah, that's the thing. I think that's where you convinced me that I would okay. rather punch a stranger that shouldn't be punched than, um, a million strangers be punched because okay. I, I can know they'll get over it in a certain amount of time. And I, so I don't know to what level where that would stop. I don't know if I would stab a stranger to save a thousand st strangers from being stabbed. But, I, but, but, but yes, yeah, so the, um, I care more about my own existence than I do about suffering I can, um, have to me, but, um, when I'm ta when I'm looking at the idea of people being taken out of existence, I guess since I care more, I wouldn't choose personally who gets taken out of existence. Um, but the suffering, um, you know what? I take that back. If I punched, if if one stranger got punched or a million strangers got punched, and I could pick which one happens, to each individual million, they're getting the same pain as the one. I, I, you can't add that up because it's not like all that pain is happening um to an individual so 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 yeah it's all the same no that this person does not deserve to be punched um just so each of these million can individually not be punched i don't nah okay um i don't know if, if you want to take this into a separate discussion we, we definitely yeah, can yeah. just continue with the video <laughs> yeah. um but do, uh, do you want way. me to do one, one more thing oh yeah yeah yeah. no either okay way. I'll, do, I'll challenge you one more one more thing on it it's like so let, let's suppose you got like some carson dollars here 
and you have a situation where there's like I'm, I'm horrible at drawing things but like let's just assume there's like some bad thing happening i'll draw like a sword <laughs> is gonna you know that's gonna stab this guy okay um how many how many carson dollars would you pay for this not to happen just carson dollar can be equal whatever just 10 I, I don't know if I fully understand that, and I'd like to. This this guy's about to get stabbed. Um, I understand that there, part. What's the Carson yeah, dollar? Just your money. Just like oh, I mean, my actual re- money. It, like arbitrary units of so like a one Carson dollar could equal what it doesn't matter. I'm just like you, you don't have to necessarily pick. I just like let's just pick a unit so that we can baseline it. That's uh, the point. So it's if somebody was going to be stabbed by somebody else, but I could offer something of my own to get them to not be stabbed. Let's just say it's just money. <laughs> just to keep it okay. Simple, I could offer money yeah. of my own um, yeah, for them not to be stabbed. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure I would pick some random extra amount of money that I don't feel like I need. I don't really spend much money at all. Um, so like 10 bucks. Would you pay 10 um, bucks? It would, it would, it'd be based on what I happen to have extra and me personally in this real world. Um, I don't know. Um, so it would be whatever that is. Pick a pick a number just for okay. Let's case. let's say let's say a, a hundred bucks. I don't know what I have. I mean, okay. I I have a savings account with a couple thousand dollars in it um, that I don't need, but I like the idea of having that savings account. Uh, so I'm gonna say five hundred dollars. Five hundred. Okay. So five five hundred bucks in this first scenario, you're you'd pay five hundred bucks out of pocket for this guy not to be stabbed. Sure. Now, like, so let, let's say you do that, and now you've like you don't have this five hundred dollars, and then like tomorrow, basically this you're in the same situation again mm-hmm. with this. Another guy is going to be stabbed, um, and this you, you get confronted with the same situation. Would okay. you? Is there any amount of money you would pay for this guy not to be? Well, stabbed? no. So um, I don't think I would cut into my own well-being or my family, loved ones, and so on. So if five hundred is all I had extra that I'd feel wouldn't cut into my livelihood, I give that the first time, and then now. Um, I just wouldn't have any more. So I, I wouldn't, um, I don't think I would, I don't know if I would get myself to rob a place to um, get that guy not, you know, I, I, like I love the books I own, but I'd probably give my books up because they're just books and I have audio books as well. Um, so I, I don't know how to answer the question if I don't have anything else to give. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you say you don't have anything else to give, but you do have more to give. It would just, it would cause... I mean, it's presumably this five hundred dollars you would have spent it on something that would have increased your well being as well. And so it's like you could spend another ten dollars and maybe, you know, you skip a breakfast or something, or I don't know, you instead of going out to eat with your family, you, you eat in and yeah, yeah, we did that because this guy was gonna get stabbed and so you know, we we scraped together another ten bucks or something. Yeah, so I'm pretty easy to please. So um, there's very few things I like to do. Most of it is hiking and getting out in the water. I have a, a kayak that was very inexpensive. Um, but I, I would give away most things that aren't keeping me specifically healthy. Um, I wouldn't sacrifice. I wouldn't give um, an apple to save somebody from being stabbed if it meant I had to eat some Oreos. Um, I, I wouldn't sacrifice my own health, but aside from that, um, I'm, I just, I'm just easy to please. So if I, if I had to give away my kayak, um, I would just go swimming. Um, I, I might not be answering your question too well, but <laughs> yeah, I, I'm trying to just think like, so, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe you would have given up kayak here also or something. And so maybe, maybe the second guy, it's like, yeah, there, I, I wouldn't give anything. So he's, you know, unfortunately not with us anymore but like what if we just like scale up this situation where instead it's like um there's a a guy with like you know a, a an assault rifle or something and he's about to like go ham on a crowded stadium of people okay we'll call them five-year-olds to make it more emotional okay yeah totally so all these poor five-year-olds or it's an elementary school or whatever it is the, these legless five-year-olds <laughs> yeah they all look, it looks like women with, oh, no, now that they have legs, they're not women anymore. So, um, so you've already given up 500 on your kayak and you've okay. said no, no to this guy already. And now you're in a third scenario where this is about to happen. Mm-hmm. Are you, are you in the same, like, no, sorry, everything I was going to give away, I already gave it. Like if the, if the guy, this guy was like Carson, like anything else, literally like you wouldn't there is no amount like if it was another penny if it was a 
Yeah, I mean, I don't, I it, again, depending on how extreme the thing is, like, so I wouldn't rob a bank to um, to save somebody unless I thought, like, the authorities were going to say, um, we see why you did it and you're, you can go free. Um, I wouldn't put myself in jail to, <laughs> to, for, for long at all to, to save people. Um, I wouldn't put myself in jail for a year to save somebody's life. Probably. Um, that might sound horrible and that's just off the top of my head. I don't know if I'd change that, but so outside of the idea of stealing from others, would I sacrifice any of my own stuff or my family's stuff? Uh, yeah. I mean, if there were some deaths on the line, I, I might, um, just go, okay, I'll, I'll give all my savings and then, um, and then, um, I will, I will figure out how to get more money to be able to survive. Um, so yeah, so let's say I gave all my savings. So we had just like a couple thousand dollars that went to this one. And then now we're on to another set of 5,000 well, kids. Yeah, and we, then, and, then and we don't even need to go there. I don't think is like, okay. cause with this guy, you, you kind of cut it off at the point of where you're, you're, you know, you felt your well-being would have reduced a certain amount and it seemed like you you put more here it was like more than just 500 in the kayak it was yeah. all your savings i want to be honest and it was the thinking it through yeah um if that guy's being stabbed the first guy I'll, I'll probably give all the couple thousand i have and so it's not it's not because the the kids okay so yeah well that's just that's interesting to me like to me it's like <sighs> i feel like it's just weird to me to not not scale up the amount of harm or the amount of like moral value for the number of people like to me this is worth more than this happening. um oh to me it's worth more so if if uh i was in both those situations at once and they said um if both of them called for all my savings and my kayak and they said you got to come and save these 5000 or this one of course mm -hmm. i would save the 5000 um, so it's, it's, uh, it's worth more if I got a pick, but if I was just going to save this guy and I gave him everything and I don't have the kayak and the savings anymore, then, um, w which is why if the trolley is going towards five people, I wouldn't make it go towards the one, but if the trolley is going towards neither, but it, it's going to take all six out unless I choose which way it goes, then I choose for it to go to the one. Um, so it's basically if I get this, options, right? So, um, this is the guy, this is the, the children, um, and tying this back to the, your moral system, you're saying like the, the deontological rule of don't kill mm -hmm. is you, you value the 5,000 over the, the one, but it's still, it's like below, it's like, it never approaches the this rule like as much as as much as this increases you know scaled up maybe there's another bar for like all like infinite you know infinite people infinite mm -hmm. um deaths or whatever it will it'll never reach the level of of the rule like there's no threshold yeah yeah okay yeah because i don't think that's I don't pretty think close I... to deontology yeah. in that case okay yeah cool okay yeah um Oh, I had a thought and it disappeared. Um, I guess it's okay. It disappeared. <laughs> cool. Okay. Yeah. That, I mean, I, I think, I think that's where I'm at and, uh, yeah, I like it. Um, now that more time has gone by, would you still sacrifice your wife for 10 million chickens? <laughs> you gotta bring that up on every stream. <laughs> so, and I, I will remind you that it wasn't just, um, a sacrifice. It was to, to free them from the, um, it wasn't Torture. like, who do I kill? It was to free them from f uh, a life of factory farming and, and yeah. torture and, and death. Yeah. And I think um, it was 1 million chickens for your own life and 10 million for your wife. Has yeah. that number changed at all? I haven't really thought about it, but okay. it, like I would, yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty, it's pretty t tough to like actually draw these lines. Like it's, and I don't think it, it matters that much. Like the point is there's a, a threshold that would be a very high number. And I, I have a difficult time, like wrapping my head around how much I value really high numbers, but yeah. there would be, there would be some threshold where I, that is very high th of chickens that I would value I, over my life. I, and, and yeah, I have a hope to convince you to stop valuing high numbers. Um, 
Because if you, if you if you wouldn't sacrifice yourself for a hundred people, but you would for a trillion or a number you can't even imagine for all the humans that are on planets we don't even know of, um, I I just ur urge you to think of the fact that if you are gone, you're gone, and uh, and it, it's very noble to sacrifice yourself for others, but uh, what does others really mean, and what? Yeah. So anyways, I, depending on your want to exist, I'm hoping that someday over the next 80 years, now, how long do we have? We probably have about 60 years to live. Uh, some, someday over the next 60 years, I want to convince you to not <laughs> okay. sacrifice yourself. Let's unpack um, that in another, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go on. I think a moment ago you, you said that you were looking forward to the end or you desired the end of animal exploitation. Uh, is that also correct terminology? I, I'm just trying to understand your position here. Is mm. it animal exploitation that you're concerned about, or is it just animal suffering? Because, of course, at least in theory, we can exploit animals without causing them any suffering. Well, that depends on how you use the term exploitation, I suppose, right? Um, I think the term exploitation generally means you're using animals or humans um, uh, or in some cases, non-sentient resources, like, you know, we're going to exploit the uh, minerals that uh, exist here. Um, uh, I think it, it, it tends to mean we're using without any consideration or any serious consideration of the interests of those who we are exploiting. Um, and clearly, if they're not sentient beings, then uh, they don't need any consideration. They're not affected by it. Um, but... Um, I, you know, there are other uses, I admit, in which you could say, well, you know, you're exploiting someone even though they benefit by it. That could be kind of a position, I suppose. And you might be saying, well, you're exploiting workers even though they benefit because you're giving them employment, but you're taking nearly all of the profit um, and giving them just, you know, just enough to get them to work for you. Uh, do you want to comment on that at all? The idea of exploiting something for their benefit, maybe like a dog. I know J uh, Jerome in the comments is very in favor of owning pets and also in favor of zoos that are done right. Because if a zoo is is kind of like a sanctuary of sorts and it's it's done right, then they're going to be better off than if they were fighting for survival out in nature. Um, so something like that, um, we don't have to get into the, the human aspect of exploiting a worker by paying them what we might call less but did you have thoughts on that um yeah i do um so with exploitation i think like the we have to think about relevant exploitation and i think this is um uh, they, they continue talking about this with a few examples but um i think peter's point is like depending on how you define exploitation he might be against it or might not be, it might not be like enough to say whether he's against it or not. And it kind of depends on a few things. And I, I, I do agree with that. It's like not all exploitation is inherently a bad thing. Um, mm -hmm. Like one example that came to my mind, the, the ones you gave, I think were pretty good too. But like the one example gave, came to my mind was like putting out a salt lick for a deer or something. Like, I, I don't know if that's actually bad mm -hmm. for them or something, but like assuming that it's just like, an, you know, a nice, little snack for them it doesn't hurt them or doesn't have any externalities to worry about it's like yeah if i put a salt lick out in my backyard or something and i i can like enjoy watching a deer come up oh it's kind of mm. cool to see a deer and they get to lick some salt it's like i am technically exploiting that because i want to feel warm and fuzzy inside that i'm helping out a deer it's, i'm doing it for myself i'm not doing it for you know i'm doing it for, the reason is for my enjoyment and feeling good about myself so, but I don't think that that is a bad form of exploitation. Similarly, like paying, I, I don't know if we want to get into this, but like mm -hmm. um, paying people, um, okay, let, let's leave the capitalism side out because th yeah. that's maybe a whole. Well, here, let me read the definition yeah. really quick of exploitation to see if it changes anything. So okay. the action or fact of treating someone unfairly in order to benefit from their work, it says work. But um, if we go by that definition, I don't think um, putting the salt lake out there is exploitation, but it is because um, you're not treating them unfairly. It, it's just that... Uh, because I think exploitation versus the word use, um, the main difference is 
that um, there's something almost a negative thing happening to um, whoever it's happening to. So, yeah, see, Peter defines it in this as um, you're taking advantage of people without giving consider or people or whatever without giving consideration to their interests. So that oh, okay, it's sort of a, a different definition. And I think what you're saying is like if there's a negative thing in addition to that, <clears throat> which is probably another definition of exploitation, maybe a mm -hmm. more common one, even I don't know. But yeah. this is like this is sort of the point is like. It, depending on whether that condition is true of like, is there a bad thing that happens for the, the being in question? Mm -hmm. That's like what I'm, what I'm calling like relevant exploitation is the ones that have the bad thing in addition. Gotcha. Yeah. Somebody else put a, a definition in here that is uh, similar to the, what Peter said and what you said, make full use of and derive benefit from a resource. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Um, so I, I think in that, in that case, um, that is right. That if you, if you give a deer something that benefits it and there's no downside to the deer, but you did it so you could enjoy seeing it, I think that's, that's completely fine. And that's, that's a very interesting um, example. Um, now one that I think is a little more complicated and, um, I got to run and pee really quick, but if you're up for talking, I think we should keep talking. Um, can you, um, basically share your thoughts with Jerome here in the chat of um, if you what, what your thoughts are on um, pet ownership um, and also maybe just respond to some people in the chat and I'll be right back. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pet ownership. So this, in my opinion, this is like um, there's there's kind of two considerations. The first one is whether in the world we live in that pet ownership is fine. And the second one is sort of in an idealized world, a future state or whatever, would we still want pet ownership to be a thing? Um, so yeah, the way the way I view it, it's, it's less in terms of ownership and more in terms of um, sort of like companionship or stewardship sort of a sense in the same way that you are a companion and steward to like a foster child or something. Um, that's sort of how I, how I view animal ownership. So if I say own, that's what I mean. Um, yeah, I think there's a, a, a large practical benefit to it in the world we live in now where there are stray dogs and whatever that are, that are, you know, rounded up because the, the society we live in doesn't have a good solution for it. And instead of killing those things, we, um, we do the dog ownership thing, which lets the dog presumably in a lot of cases have a good life. And so I, when I think about myself or other people that have um, pets, I, I think my dog has a better life than I do, to be honest with you. So it's like it's 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 again, it seems like that that it's a good thing that this dog has an ability to to have a life, and you know, um, in an idealized future world, um, that's sort of the question. So it's like would pet ownership still be a thing? And uh, Jerome, I wonder what you would think about that. I think like the point where we're like breeding something into existence for our own benefit, I don't think, I don't think is a good thing. I, I like, um, I, I, if there was a way for, if, it, if there was a way for them in our society to, to function and be free, like free is a big thing for me as well as just like a good life. And like there isn't right now in some sort of idealized future world, if like dogs could be allowed to, to breed and like live a free life and kind of come and go as they please, I, I could see that being a thing. I don't know that I would, that that's sort of what people visualize by pet ownership though. So that's sort of the condition that I think would need to be true for us to live with animals and have anim like uh, sort of our, our domesticated animals in the future. Um, curious to hear what your thoughts are on that though, Jerome. That I didn't get too much further, Carson, than uh, the oh, Jerome question. Yeah. 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 No. And he's very interesting to talk to So when we start up um, that um, moral philosophy channel, he'll be a good guest to have on there. Yeah, uh, Angelo. Angelo uh, seems like Angelo agrees. Uh, pet ownership should transition its way out. Pets today shouldn't be strayed, but breeding should be 100% illegal. Yeah, and and so I wonder, Angelo, what you think about um, sort of the the spaying and neutering, if that is a good thing. It's like a thing that we do 
without consent to these animals to prevent you know future it's not breeding but it's allowing them to breed which is something they they kind of in you know inherently want to do um but we we do this potentially painful and dangerous operation in order to prevent it to prevent like that future um animal from coming into this same situation maybe better than the alternative but i wonder if like in the ideal future world what do you think about what i'm sort of visualizing of allowing the animals to you know breed and come and go as they please if that could kind of function in our society mm -hmm. yeah I, I don't i don't think um it it could function in our society with cars and whatnot but um if there um was some kind of a large piece of land where um you could put all cats and dogs don't spay and neuter them and they can just try to survive on their own out in this land um then i could i could see that kind of a come and go and they exist but um i but i would say um i hadn't really thought of it before but is spaying and neutering worse than euthanizing like if 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 we we created these animals and if we think that they sh shouldn't exist and we want to outlaw pet ownership would it be better to youth or to spay and neuter them and have them on a sanctuary living out their lives or is the spaying and neutering um part of something that's so horrible that it might be better to euthanize them yeah are you asking my my opinion yeah, is that yeah. it, it's not as bad i don't think it's as bad as euthanizing at all um, okay assuming assuming we have a way of of giving them a good life and and my the way that i come to that conclusion is by just picturing myself as a dog and the ability to live in a sanctuary where i could have a good life without my genitals or uh mm -hmm. just being killed and i think i would choose the genital free sanction like good life sanctuary thing where i have limited you know, somewhat limited freedom, but still it feels like I have a lot. And yeah, hmm. that's, I think what I would choose. Yeah. Um, really quick before getting back to the video, uh, Jerome says, um, I think if we assume the animal has a net positive life, uh, which I think we can, we should have an obligation to breed them. Oh, that's right. Jerome thinks that um, existing is a good thing for something that does, hasn't existed yet. I don't know if you agree with that, but I strongly don't agree with that. I, I'm, I'm accepting of part of animal instincts is to continue breeding. So I don't want to make any animal, including humans, stop breeding. But um, if all of a sudden everybody, every animal just decided not to breed anymore, I don't think there's any moral argument for why we should keep breeding. I don't care about something's existence that doesn't exist. Yep. I'm with you. Oh, okay, cool. I, I, I thought I saw a head shake that meant that you weren't with me. And so I was curious to hear your thoughts. No, so, it's, yeah, it, my so. position is a little more nuanced than that, but um, mm -hmm. uh, in broad strokes, I, it mostly boils down to, I agree. So that's, yeah, cool, cool. Uh, and then the, the last thing I wanted to ask you on the pet ownership thing, um, the, the element I disagree with uh, Jerome on is, or I think it might be Jerem. I need to ask him again, but anyways, um, so if if we cannot communicate with an animal, is it ever reasonable for us to think that we can claim it is having a a good life, uh, or or that it's accepting of the life that we're giving it? Um, I'm yeah. I mean, if if we literally could not communicate, I think it would probably be very difficult. But like, um, there are other ways of assessing level of happiness. I think as well um and plus we can sort of communicate with animals in in some limited ways so a i don't accept that we can't communicate with animals and b even if we couldn't i think that it's possible through other means we could determine um or at least take a, a good guess at determining whether or not they have a net positive or net negative life mm, gotcha gotcha um okay here we go like um, amount of time oh. spent playing versus worried about survival or something could be an indicator just as an example. I don't know if that's the best one. Yeah. But, yeah. No, I mean, that is a good point. Cause yeah, I don't know. Like I don't want to be owned by anything if an alien species came and owned me. Um, but I am comparing that to the freedom I currently have, which uh, aside from humans getting to this level of creating this, this uh, kind of leisure and luxury, um, other animals do not have this, and most animals, 95% of them don't make it to adulthood. So um, 
So th that it is a different story. But yeah, if an alien species came and uh, took humans and spayed and neutered them and treated them well, gave them food they enjoyed and put them on their lap and pet them, uh, like, would I want, would I prefer to not exist over this or but better yet than not exist? Would I prefer to be like an animal out in the wild trying to survive, but be free? Or would I prefer being owned by this good alien pet slave owner? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, okay. I'll hit play here. Uh, yes, that could be exploitation. Um, and I might think that that is wrong um, because that is not maximizing the welfare of all concerned because the welfare of the workers is not probably being taken into account. Um, so, you know, I think whether, whether you regard um, a utilitarian position as one that can use the term exploitation or not is going to depend entirely on which of these ways you're going to, going to use that term. And I think people, again, they understand it in a, in a popular sense as saying, you're making use of beings without taking their interest into account. Um, and if that's the usage, then I certainly want to say we should stop the exploitation of animals. If you have some more sophisticated meaning of the term, then tell me what that is and I'll tell you whether I think that that is or is not acceptable. Well, I've sometimes heard exploitation defined as using something as a means to an end rather than as an end in itself. So, for example, an exa uh, a uh, in, in animal farming, we might talk of egg production or milk production, which, of course, in practice is a pretty disgusting industry. But in theory, you know, uh, the question is often asked of vegans, well, would you have a, a backyard chicken farm egg or would you have milk if it came from a cow that was treated nicely? And, and sometimes the response comes that even if it is actually the case that these animals aren't suffering in the production of these products, which oftentimes they are, I mean, chickens laying eggs, uh, if they've been selectively bred to lay more than natural, for example, it can still be painful. But presuming that it wasn't, a lot of people say, but this is still exploitation. You know, something like, look, it's not your product. It's not your egg. It's not your milk. And even though there's there's no discernible suffering that you could measure in, in the animal's brain, a lot of vegans say that, again, on, on principle, they think it would still be wrong to take those products because it's a form of exploitation. That is, seeing these animals as means to ends rather than ends in themselves, seeing them as the producers of food, seeing them as food to themselves, which, of course, those perceptions are not at least directly going to harm the animal, but it's still seen as a problem. Um, so we've gone over this before, so I don't think we need to cover it too much, but for anybody listening that hasn't heard us go over it, um, there's a handful of cases where I think both of us feel fine uh, using animal products. If a, a cow is out in nature and it poops, we can uh, use its poop that it's leaving behind for fertilizer. If an e if a chicken leaves an egg behind and there it's not fertilized, or even if it is fertilized, uh, it, in your case, if it hasn't reached sentience um, and the chicken's not coming back for it, it's okay to use. Um, but do you want to elaborate on any of your thoughts um, of what he just said about like a backyard chicken or a uh, cow's milk if the yeah, cow isn't bothered? It it comes down to the main just difference in my view relative to theirs is they're talking like they only see things in terms of harm created and suffering. Whereas I'm looking at all of the rights, the relevant rights violations, the, the, which are the negative rights, a subset of the negative rights violations. Um, mm -hmm. The ones that I find morally relevant. So right to life, I think is a morally relevant one. Um, right. And freedom is another morally relevant one. So I think that both of those things, for example, in the farm, well, maybe not the life one, but the freedom one certainly um, would factor into both of those farming situations that, that Alex is talking about with the backyard um, eggs and the, the happy cow or whatever he said for the, for the farming one. So he's just not factoring those things in because it's not relevant to his moral system i think his moral system has a lot of wacky entailments like the one you said about the you know, five people getting a lot of pleasure out of having their way with somebody mm -hmm. the, the another a classic example is like a utilitarian would harvest the organs of one person to save you know they would go and grab that person and drag them into the operating room chop them up if it meant that five people could live assuming there was mm -hmm. you know 
no externalities like you'd have to be done in secret or whatever um but yeah i, I think that yeah. utilitarianism wa has wacky reductios that i just i can't get my so, head around so what if you just look at the view um and remove the utilitarian idea of the pleasure outweighing the suffering so if they say that um the benefit somebody might get from eating an egg from a backyard hen might outweigh the little suffering if there's if there's practically no suffering from them being a free range chicken. What if we just remove the pleasure part? Like, who cares how much pleasure the human gets from the egg? Um, how bad is eating the egg if uh, if it's in the backyard? Um, so let's say um, so I have three rescue guinea pigs. Let's say that there is a rescue that um, was going to let. Uh, let's say there's no sanctuary to take some chickens in. So um, chickens were going to be euthanized unless um, you, Michael, um, adopted them, basically put them in your backyard. And these chickens would lay eggs, but they're not fertilized. There's no rooster. Um, what are your thoughts? If your backyard is uh, big enough that you think it's better to have them in your backyard than euthanize them, um, what are your thoughts on the eggs? Okay. Are you asking me to internally critique their position from the perspective of utilitarianism or to mm -hmm. are you asking me just your own okay and the situation is um chickens about to be euthanized and i can either let that happen or take them into my backyard and eat their eggs uh take them into your backyard but um do you see a problem with eating the eggs if you choose the backyard one um and so if i choose the backyard one uh, so yeah this is something again that i want to talk about more because it touches on another topic that they bring up but it, i don't know if like i've heard that eating eggs it's like chickens should be like that since they have so many eggs a lot of the nutrients in their body or something go into the eggs and so they get um like nutrient deficient unless they consume their eggs and so let's assume that's to, like, not true that doesn't happen um so they they don't even want their eggs or just there i don't see a problem if it's yeah. it, it, i don't see a difference with the cow poop in that situation though yeah yeah no i i don't either um now now there is an area that i do see an issue with and you should let me know if you think the same i think it would there'd be a moral issue with telling anybody about it uh the more people you tell the worse because if you the normalizing of it yeah i yeah i agree i mean okay. you could like with the externality thing that could go in either direction though it's like maybe telling people about that then other people start um not buying grocery store eggs and getting these similar like rescue chickens into their backyards and once they die off they're not breeding more and like if if everyone went that way the, what, like what would happen like there could be externalities in either direction um but for the sake of the hypothetical if we factor all of it out um yeah i don't see an issue Gotcha. Yeah, I, I feel similarly like um, like part of me thinks that if you're going to rescue an animal, um, this is good. But part of me thinks that if you rescue an animal and you kind of normalize it by other people um, viewing it as the animal ownership's OK, it, that it, it's not good. Um, so part of me wants to rescue every single animal. And another part of me wants as many people as possible to refuse to rescue domesticated animals. That way we can keep pushing this message of humans don't own animals so even if these ones have to be euthanized um we're working towards a, a non-owning standard yeah. uh jerome asked a quick question about that he said if ch chickens have good lives why not normalize it um because other things matter than the fact that they have good lives is the answer yeah well i, I think part of it is if you normalize it then you're normalizing the breeding into existence and i don't mean it I don't like slippery slope arguments. Also, sorry, just to, to my perspective, it's the, the fact that they don't have, they have the negative right infringed on of freedom is the reason yeah. that it matters uh, in my view. And then there's externalities, which you, you were getting at as well. Yeah. And the reason the freedom doesn't matter in a sense, is kind of like um, the, the dog you have that's a rescue dog. That dog doesn't have its freedom, but you are giving it a better life than it would have otherwise. And you think that having it is better than euthanizing it. So I think the same thing would be with the rescue chicken, but not with the breeding. Right. Of chicken. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. I agree with you there. Um, so if chicken, um, chickens have a good life, why not normalize it? So, so yeah, if, if, if you normalize the rescuing of chickens that right. are truly rescued, 
then normalizing that is fine. But if you, if people see my cute guinea pigs on the videos I have that I am removing because I am against having them up there, um, if they see those and go to PetSmart, which you can go to PetSmart right now, this is not a commercial, this is a anti-commercial, you can buy a guinea pig and you shouldn't do that. Even though PetSmart has them in these tiny cages, you buying them is putting them in demand and they bring more in there and they should not be selling them. And so me making them look super cute on my videos is making people not go rescue guinea pigs. They're, they're seeing how cute they are and they want to go buy them. So if somebody hears about this chicken in this backyard, they might go and purchase chickens that are part of the egg industry. And it's, um, it's, uh, it, it, there's a negative element to it. So it really depends on, uh, which route you go. Um, let's see, we got Garland farms in here. There are nutrients in eggs not found in plants, so by keeping your egg consumption a secret while claiming to be a 100% plant, uh, plant diet, uh, you're lying and misrepresenting uh, the feasibility of veganism. Yeah, I mean, again, that's an externality that could go in either direction. It's like if you're getting some benefit from a health perspective from the eggs then that's sort of what garland's saying if you're getting some harm like the increased consumption of cholesterol and likely dying it's like that's a that's an externality that goes the other direction if the point is that like lying is fundamentally wrong and you're doing a wrong action by lying about it okay sure <laughs> i don't know like i don't know i i don't know i don't know how that's it's not it's not really relevant to the point like we're talking about like well, at least my view, I was talking about the externalities aside, like, is the action right or wrong? And it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. you, you can certainly get into the externalities and the, the impact on lying about what you're eating or something and whether that is moral. That's a separate discussion you could have for sure. Yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm personally not a fan of lying, but um, what people consider lying by omission, um, I view very differently. If I were to encourage people to not smoke, but I couldn't get a, kick the habit, I would smoke in my backyard or my garage, and I would not tell people about it because I, I think it would be more immoral to, um, to talk people into smoking. Um, and if somebody said, do you smoke? I'd say, yes, I'm ashamed of it. So on and so forth. Same thing with the chicken. Um, I think it might be best to not tell people if you had a backyard chicken, cause you don't want to normalize it. But if somebody said like, do you eat eggs and you don't feel comfortable lying, which I don't, I would say, well, here's the thing. Um, I don't think eggs are that healthy, but I don't mind eating one a week. And I have these backyard chickens, but I only have them because they're rescues. And I don't think it's it's moral to purchase chickens or to breed chickens to be backyard chickens. And I'd give the spiel, and hopefully um, that person wouldn't be encouraged to do something bad. Um, okay, here we go. Yes, I, I don't see it as a problem if it's not harming the animal or, or others. And in fact, the, uh, the sort of Kantian idea that it's always wrong to use somebody as a means rather than as an end. I'm actually going to say one more thing, essentially responding to Garland here, because um, really what I would probably do is I would give these eggs to people that I know that eat eggs and hope that that would make them purchase less at stores because I have no reason to believe that it's healthy to eat eggs and I care about my health. So um, it wouldn't be based on the idea of what, let's say, David C. Arnest says about not eating roadkill. Um, I'd put roadkill and chicken eggs in the same category of, I don't think it's immoral to do this thing. Um, and I don't care that it's, it's uh, technically part of an animal, but I, but I would say since it's not healthy and I don't want to have it, um, I would, I would give it to, um, to somebody to help them not purchase eggs. I don't think is defensible. Um, even when you apply it to humans, uh, Derek Parfit has uh, an example, um, where you're in a building, which is slowly crumbling or collapsing for some reason. And, um, hey, Carson, your child is with you. Yeah, because this is about to get into a different topic. Um, mm -hmm. Would it be cool if we stopped this one yeah. around now and then picked up the rest of this in a, in a part two? Yeah, definitely. OK, cool. Was there yeah. any of the chat you wanted to go through or anything before we sign off? I got a few more minutes, um, but I got to get going pretty soon. Yeah, no, um, I think we covered everything. I was going to stop it at the the time that you mentioned in our message, the 27 and a half minutes in, and we're 23 and a half. Um, but I think this is a fine point oh. to stop, and I don't think there are any other questions over here. 
Um, I do see, I do see. Um, it's broken up into little categories, and we're almost to the end of a of a of a category, the exploitation and suffering category. Should we finish that one off so we know the exact starting point? Sure. Okay. And there's a large concrete block that is slowly coming on top of your child and will crush your child to death. And the only way you can stop this is by moving uh, the leg of an unconscious person who's been injured, rendered unconscious in this accident that's causing the building to crumble. And if you move their leg to sort of hold up the concrete block, uh, they will have a broken toe, but your child will be saved. Um, now, you're using them as a means. They haven't given consent. Um, they're going to be injured slightly, um, but your child's life is going to be saved. Um, I think that's the right thing to do. I think it would actually be wrong to say, no, I can't touch the stranger. I can't do something that will harm the stranger in any way without the stranger's consent. Therefore, I must allow my child to be crushed to death. That seems grotesque to me. So, so it's not an absolute rule. Um, I don't think. I think anybody who thinks carefully about it will say it's not an absolute rule that you can never use another human being as a means to an end without their consent. And I don't think it's an absolute rule for non-human animals as well. And perhaps that could still be considered exploitation under some definitions. But I guess there you would just be saying that exploitation isn't isn't always wrong. I, I know that. Okay, that's where it splits off into the next category. Um... So I'll take it even further. Um, I would, this is, this is messed up, but it's, it's, it's complicated when we talk about ourselves and our love, uh, our loved ones. But if there was somebody unconscious and I needed to use them to save my child, I would use them in a way that ended their life. So I definitely use them in a way that, uh, that breaks their, their toe. Now there would be like a legal element where, um, breaking the toe, you probably wouldn't get in a wild amount of trouble, but ending the life you would, but just looking from the moral standpoint. Um, but yeah, do you have any thoughts on that using a person to save another person? Um, yes, same, same kind of thing. Like, uh, it, to me, it comes down to the negative rights violations primarily. And if, whether though, whether there is a certain utility threshold that is crossed in doing so to justify it. So, yeah, an unconscious person who will regain consciousness or or if they're I don't think it matters that much if they're unconscious or not. Um, I would treat that fairly pretty much in the same way in terms of the negative rights violations that are experienced. But yeah, I think it's I wouldn't do it unless there was like a, a very significant utility threshold that was crossed on the other on the other side. Um, yeah, that's basically my answer. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I think I have, I have the same thing. So I think even though I, I lean towards almost complete deontology, I think there are elements where there are thresholds. Um, so because I, because I think not only would I definitely do this for my own child, but if it was just a stranger, if I, if it was breaking the toe of one stranger to save the life of another stranger. Um, I, I, you know, I'd feel bad that I broke the toe, but I would, I would do it. And I think, I th uh, maybe that still fits into the deontology because I have a, a strong stance on the life being ended of something that doesn't want to die. Um, versus... no, that would be a, that would be the other side. The, the deontology would refer to the, um, the, the action. So the action taken would be breaking someone's toe in oh, this, in I this see. case. And so if you had a very strong deontological uh, framework, you would say there is no amount of welfare or like, or, you know, negative rights infringements or whatever that are uh, impacted that would cause me to go against my day logical obligation to not break the toe. So, mm. yeah, so maybe, I, I mean, you can have different thresholds for different things. Like you could have a very high threshold for a, a large amount of pain and a low threshold or something for a low amount of, of, you know, breaking a toe or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Well, that's a good point to stop. So I'm going to end the broadcast. But yeah, everybody, thanks for watching. And um, I'll be back to do another live stream, um, I believe at 11. So in about an hour. Uh, so take care, guys.